Please turn to Philippians chapter 4 in your Bible. It's been a good day in church, at least that's what I think. It's been a good day in church, it's been good to worship with you, and it's so nice. I always think of this, whenever the weather's terrible, I'm so glad I can go to church and be happy and worship God and be around people. Because if you just sat at home and looked out the window, it might make you kind of sad, but you don't have to do that. You can come to church and be joyful, and that's a blessing. I really enjoyed this morning's message, Pastor Snyder. That was really touched me and, and just encouraged me, that reminder that we're in Christ. We need that reminder, don't we? It makes all the difference in the world. And even though we know it, we don't live like it. That was very encouraging. Let's read Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5 this evening. Verses 1 through through, we're in the last chapter of the book, coming down towards the end here. The Apostle Paul, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with, with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the instruction that it gives. Thank you for the correction and the reproof, the wisdom. Lord, we need your word. We need your truth. And we thank you for the Apostle Paul and his ministry. Help us to glean tonight from this letter to understand the truths and apply them to our lives. Help me as I preach, Lord. Give me focus. Help me to preach with clarity, boldness, and help us to grow from what we hear tonight. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. As many of you know, I served in the military at age 18. I joined the Marine Corps and went away to boot camp. It was a very interesting experience, to put it mildly. But in Marine Corps boot camp, you're there for 13 weeks, which feels about like six years. But you're there for 13 weeks, and you have no uh, connection with the outside world, no phones. Uh, when, you, when you arrive, you make one phone call to let your parents know you're okay, and then no connection. And I remember as an 18-year-old at boot camp in a very stressful uh, situation and a lot of insanity going on. I remember on Fridays we would get mail. And that was always a big deal to get mail from home. It was actually pretty humorous because on mail day, they would stand and they would call your name and pass out the mail. And all the recruits were very thrilled to get mail. But I remember that on mail day, they would call out, you know, so-and-so, they'd give them one or two mails. And every time they got to my name, I'd get at least a dozen letters. And they'd be like, recruit Tyson, recruit Tyson, recruit Tyson. And it became a joke after a while. And the reason that was is because Misty was writing, my, my mom was writing me, but mostly my dad wrote me a letter every day. Every day he wrote me a letter. And he was writing me, and it was really an encouragement. It really helped me when I was there. But I remember my dad would write a lot of different things. He, he, he spent a lot of time telling me what was going on at home. He also would write me and tell me how proud he was of me and that he was thankful for me. But one thing he wrote is he wrote me a lot of scripture. And specifically, he would write passages to try to encourage me to stay strong in the Lord. I remember he wrote... Proverbs 10.1 a lot, it says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. I remember him writing that passage. He was saying, hey, what you do is going to have a big impact on us. I remember him writing one of my favorite passages, Psalm 1, he's, that says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of, of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verses like that, verses that encourage me to be strong in the Lord. My dad wrote those letters specifically because he knew, well, he wrote them because he loved me, first of all. But he also wrote them because he knew that I was entering a culture that had a lot of 
pressure and a lot of temptations to sin. I was entering the military like many you know, different things. There's a ton of peer pressure and pressure to live ungodly and to live sinfully. And my parents knew that I was going into the lion's den to say that I was going to be faced with a lot of pressure. And they were concerned for me. They did not want to see me fall away from God. It was a big burden on their heart. And I'm thankful by God's grace that I stayed true to the Lord. I wasn't perfect. I sinned during that time. But the Lord did keep me. He protected me from falling into many of the vices and the wickedness. But when I think about my parents' love for me and their concern for me, I very much think that's a good illustration of verse 1 and what Paul is saying here. Look at verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. Paul loves these people so much. He loves these church people. And his desire is that, he says, so stand fast in the Lord. Paul loves them so dearly, and his main concern for them is that they stand fast fast in the Lord. I love what a commentator wrote about this statement. He said, this statement is a call to the church to resist against antagonistic forces that will undoubtedly attack and a call to continue in steadfastness in their union with Jesus. Paul's recognizing that this church is going to face many trials, many temptations. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be a temptation to pull away from Christ And that's why he's writing this in love. He's calling them to stand fast in the Lord. And he he cares about that because he loves them. And as believers, when we love people, we don't want to see them fall away from God, do we? That hurts so much. When we love people, we want to see the best for them. And the best for everybody is a close walk with Jesus Christ. So that's Paul's burden for the church in Philippi here is that they stand fast fast in the Lord. And I believe that the rest of this chapter, pretty much everything Paul's going to talk about is something that he's trying to encourage them. This is one of the ways that you can stand fast in the Lord. This is one of the ways you can do it is these things. And he's going to cover many topics. We're going to talk about three of them tonight, but he's going to cover multiple things and we'll, we'll cover the rest in the weeks ahead. But tonight, let's look at three ways we can stand fast in the Lord. Three ways we can stand fast in the Lord. The first one we're going to see in verses 2 through 3, and that is we must pursue unity. We must pursue unity. Let's look at verses 2 and 3. And I'll tell you right off the bat, I don't know how to pronounce these names. I, you know, I'm not even, I'm, I'm just going to try, but I have no idea. So verse 2, Paul says, I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So obviously we're not, we're not privy to this information, do we? There's something going on here. And you know what? I'm kind of glad Paul didn't go into the details, but there's something going on here. These are two ladies, and they're not unified. They're having some type of conflict. And we don't know what the problem was, but the problem must have been fairly big because Paul knows about it from a prison cell in Rome. So there's some kind of problem here. He says in verse 3, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women, referring back to verse 2, which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose name are in the book of life. Paul knows about a situation in the church of Philippi, and he's encouraging these ladies to pursue unity. Notice Paul doesn't really seem to take sides, does he? He, he addresses both the women equally and says the same thing to them. So he's not getting into the debate or picking sides. He's just encouraging them both to be of the same mind in the Lord. You know, this passage shows us that good Christians are going to have disagreements, aren't they? The, the verse says that both these women had served Paul in the gospel. These were not only saved people, but these were people that were active in ministry. These are faithful people. They had served with Paul, and they're both believers. It says in verse 3 that their names are written in the book of life, and yet they were having a conflict. 
You know, it's, it's unrealistic and it's unwise for us to think that we bring up all us sinners into this room and we try to work together that we're not going to have some conflicts. We are. We are. We're going to have some disagreements. We're going to have some conflicts. We're going to butt heads at times. But this truth that he's commanding them is very important. We must pursue unity. We must pursue peace. We must not allow issues to go on and on. I find it interesting that Paul doesn't tell them to compromise or to get along. He says, be of the same mind in the Lord. What is he saying there? I think what he's telling them is they, they need to come to an agreement around spiritual things. I think he's saying you need to be unified around the, the Lord, the mission of the church, what you believe. And that's important for us. We've talked about that already in this book. But what are we unified about? We are unified about the gospel, what we believe about Jesus Christ, and what we are called to do as a church. And I believe that's what Paul's exhorting these ladies to be like-minded in the Lord, to have the same mind. He, notice Paul also in verse 3, he encourages a person, he calls him his true companion. He doesn't say who this is, but Paul's asking another person to help. We don't know exactly what's going on here, but it, it seems to be that Paul's asking this person to mediate and to help bring unity between these, these two ladies. And that's important, too. Sometimes when we're struggling to resolve an issue, it is good and helpful to bring someone spiritual in to help, help us solve those problems so that we can, we can maintain unity, so that we can, we can get the problem out of the way. Folks, as Christians, if we don't pursue peace, if we allow conflicts to go on in the church, there are so many negative consequences to that. If we have a disagreement with somebody and we don't take care of it, it can lead to anger, to bitterness, to division, to rivalry. Our church cannot function the way it should function if we have contention between one another. I think what Paul is also saying here is that your relationship with God and your ability to stand fast in the Lord is affected by your relationship with your fellow believers. Remember, he's commanding them, stand fast in the Lord. I love you so much. I care about you so much. Stand fast in the Lord. And then he shifts immediately to this area of disagreement. As Christians, if we're going to stand fast in the Lord, we have to resolve our issues between one another. It's sad, but it's true. I've witnessed situations where Christians had conflicts with one another, and one of the parties leaves the church. And I've even seen situations where the party that left the church never attended a new church. They just left church completely. How sad is that? That is so sad. And obviously that reveals that they may have been in church for the wrong reasons to begin with. But it also points out how important it is in our relationships, in this room and in this building, we have got to pursue peace with each other. We have to pursue peace. Unresolved conflicts have a very negative impact on our church and on your walk with God both. I remember a time in the church I grew up in, I won't go into any details, but just to be general, there was about a three-year period of intense conflict. There was church discipline. There was a, a coup, you could say. There was a group of people trying to battle for power. There was tension. It was a very stressful time at our church. And I remember there was attempts at reconciliation, attempts at change, and it went on and on and on. And eventually, some of the parties left the church. And I was very discouraged at that time. I thought, we're already a small church. We just lost two or three families. I thought, we're done. You know, throw in the towel. Our church is done. We might as well fold the doors. We just lost 30% of our church. And you know what I was so amazed at? Is the following Sunday, you walked in the room and everything was completely different. The, the stress and the tension had left the building. And there was a sweet spirit of love and unity. And you know what? The church started growing again. Things recovered. 
And it was like, wow, we're not dead after all. I guess God's in control. But what that taught me, what that incident taught me, is I was focused on numbers, but I had underestimated the importance of unity. It's huge, folks. And you know what? You can actually feel it when you come in a building. When visitors visit this place, they're either going to sense a love and unity in this room, or they're going to sense tension and conflict. And even if it's happening behind the scenes, I, in our church, you could, like, I, I, the tension was so thick you could just take a knife and cut it, right? I mean, it was thick. And that killed the growth, it killed the spirit, it killed the excitement. It's so important as believers that we're pursuing unity. And that's what Paul is saying to the church in Philippi, advising these two women, advising this other man or person to get involved, to get these conflicts resolved, to pursue unity. Maybe you have a disagreement with someone at this church. Maybe they're making a decision you don't like or you're, they're doing something you don't like. Let me just give you if, you, if I can for a minute, let me give you just a couple quick practical tips, okay? Because at some point you're going to disagree with somebody around here. At some point. Just a few things. First of all, don't assume that the person has a sinful motive. So often what we do is we ascribe a sinful motive to someone's behavior. We don't give them the benefit of the doubt. We just assume that they are wrong, they're sinful in this, and then we get angry, and that makes us more mad at them. How dare they? They're so ungrateful. Look at what they did. They're so ungrateful, or they're so, you know, they're so rude. Can you believe how they responded in that? That really causes problems when we ascribe sinful motives to people and we don't even know what's going on. The best thing to do, and what the Bible teaches, is that if somebody's offended you, what do you do? Anybody know what the Bible says? You go to that person. Now, I heard some of you say forgive. That's a good option too, right? It's actually not forgiveness. That's called forbearance. As Christians, we can forbear. That means we just have a disposition of forgiveness and when somebody sins against us, we just let it go. We don't even go to them. We just love them and say, oh, bless your heart, and we just move on. That's forbearance. That's wonderful. But often when somebody offends us or we disagree or they sin against us, we're hurt. And if we're hurt in our heart, we can't just forbear it. We need to deal with it. And so many problems in churches are caused from this. Two people have an issue, and they're talking outwardly, but they don't sit down and talk to each other. And what, what's Paul telling these ladies here? Hey, you need to be of the same mind. He's implying here, you need to get together, you need to work through this issue. And as Christians, we need to be quick to go to somebody and say, hey, why did you do that? Maybe they'll, they maybe were thinking something you totally weren't thinking. Hey, oh, I understand why you did that. I'm not upset anymore. Whatever it is. The point is, when we pursue peace, when we pursue unity, it's important that we address these things early on. We avoid the anger and the bitterness and the, the broken relationship. We deal with the problem right away. This is crucial. If we're going to hold fast to the Lord in our personal lives, if we're going to have peace and unity in our church, we have to. To pursue unity, we have to pursue peace. What an important truth. Let's look at the second thing this evening it we see in verse 4. Verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. This is a reoccurring topic in this book, isn't it? Paul keeps coming back to this. this is, Paul has talked about rejoicing in every chapter of the book, and this is the second time that he's given this command. He gave it in chapter 3. Why is Paul repeating this? You know, it's a short book. Why is he repeating it? He's repeating it because it is so very important. It is so very important for us to rejoice in the Lord. What does that mean, to rejoice in the Lord? To rejoice in the Lord, it's a command for us to find our joy, our satisfaction, and our fulfillment in God. Who God is what he has done, and how he loves us. That's what it is. Rejoice in the Lord. 
The reason I think, one of the reasons this is so important is because when we find our joy in God, it releases everything else in our lives into its proper place. And here's what I mean by this. So all too often, we're trying to get joy and satisfaction from other things. And God did not design those things to give you joy and satisfaction, whether it be in a, in a material thing or in a relationship as a child or as, you know, in your children or in your parents or in your spouse or a friend. You name it, whatever it is that you're trying to get ultimate satisfaction and joy out of that relationship, it's not going to work. And you know that when you're trying to do that, when you're trying to get joy out of that relationship, you actually put a strain on that relationship, don't you? That's a lot of pressure to live up to, isn't it? Have you ever felt like you, you have a real burden to try to be like, oh man, I'm a I'm friend of this person and they really depend on me and I'm going to disappoint them. You ever feel that way? Like, oh, I'm doomed to disappoint this person. It, it could be that they're really trying to get joy out of your, their relationship with you. And while it's great to enjoy relationships and even to enjoy material things, God did not design those things to give us joy, did he? God wants us to have joy in him. When we get this, as believers, when we embrace this truth, when we're living day to day and we're having this joy because of our walk with God, this joy because of our salvation, that just frees everybody in our life and everything in our life to say, hey, I'm not depending on you for my joy. And then we can have a, you can have a better marriage. You can have a better friendship. You can enjoy your material thing more when you're not trying to get ultimate fulfillment and joy out of it. Those things change. Relationships change. Material things get old. You know, you buy, a, buy something new, and next thing you know, you look at it, and you think, oh, they're so much better now. You know? You get an iPhone 6 or something, and next thing you know, there's iPhone 12. I don't know. I don't do iPhone. I think Apple company's evil. I stay away from them altogether. But you know the point. It's so quickly fleeting, isn't it? You get a new car, you get something nice, and next thing you know, you're unsatisfied. Relationships and material things, they change. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when we place our joy in the Lord, he's not changing. That's an unchanging, consistent source of joy. What, how amazing is that? And that joy, the way God designed us to have our joy in him, that can transcend our circumstances. We talked about that last couple weeks ago when, when we preached this same verse in chapter 3. This idea that this is joy that transcends our circumstances. That's what we need as believers. We need this joy. Paul is reiterating it over and over again because this church they needed the reminder that their joy should come from God, from a person, from a relationship. I love this song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's one of my favorite songs. I'll just read a verse in the chorus here. It says, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As believers, how are we going to get joy from God? We have to look at him, think about his glory, his goodness, and think about his grace in our lives. And that should bring us great joy. When we realize that we deserve hell and punishment... And yet we are adopted by God and reconciled to God and have all the blessings he gives us. That is, should give us joy that transcends our circumstances. Tonight we're going to observe the Lord's Supper just in a few minutes here. What a great opportunity for us to remember what Christ did for us. The Lord's Supper should be a tool in our life to bring about and well in us joy, the joy of the Lord. Although it's a soberness to realize the pain and anguish that Christ suffered for us, we turn around and we rejoice in that, don't we? 
Because that was our punishment taken on the cross. So I ask you tonight, are you actively seeking your joy, your satisfaction, and your fulfillment through your relationship with God? Is that where you're seeking it? How do you do that? How do you keep a close relationship with God? Well, let me ask you a couple questions on this point. When was the last time you poured your heart out to God in prayer? I'm not talking about, Lord, please help the orphans, please help the sick. Those are good prayers. I'm not diminishing them. But I think sometimes we get this obligatory check-in-the-box prayer that really has very little heart in it. When was the last time when you verbally prayed to God and just poured your heart out to him? That's relationship. That's what you do in a relationship. You open and you reveal yourself and you talk. You communicate. When was the last time? When was the last time you read God's word expectantly and in faith? You entered God's word and you you read it and you said, God, show me something. Teach me something. Help me, grow me, illuminate my spirit and my heart through your Holy Spirit. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you praised God with your lips? These are all part of our relationship with God. And these are ways we can judge. How is my walk with God? How is my prayer life? How is my Bible reading? Do I have a close walk with God right now? Because we are so, as the song says prone to wander, aren't we? And we quickly forsake our close relationship. And right after we forsake that relationship, we tend to seek our joy in other things. And we can very quickly lose our joy. So tonight, we need to seek our joy in the Lord. We need to find our joy in, find our joy in God. Let's see the third thing in verse five tonight is the third thing is we must have a gentle spirit we must have a gentle spirit read verse five with me it says let your moderation be known unto all men the lord is at hand how many of you have heard the saying all things in moderation how many of you heard that all things in moderation i grew up hearing that all things in moderation where did that saying come from I don't really know. I'm guessing it came from this verse right here. This is the only verse in the Bible that uses that word moderation. You know, it's kind of funny how words change meaning, don't they? You know, the meaning and the definition of word is based off how the word is used, right? That's how we define words and words have meaning is how we use them. And words change meaning over time, don't they? I won't give a bunch of examples, but what about the word troll? Have you heard that? So for many years, the word troll was like this mini little mystical creature that lived under a bridge, you know? Actually, the people in the UP call us trolls because we live under the bridge, right? But if you say the word troll now, you're probably referring to what we would call a keyboard warrior, right? Somebody who sits there and goes online and antagonizes people and leaves annoying comments. That's the way we use the word troll now. So what was a troll is a totally different thing now, right? So words change in meaning. That's the point. They do. Over time, we change in how we use words. Well, this word moderation that we see in verse 5 is, is such a case. The word moderation in the 1500s and the 1600s, it had a similar meaning, but it was different. The word had the, the idea is, uh, the definition is a quality of being moderate or temperate, a lessening of rigor or severity. So in the 1500s and 1600s, this word moderation had to do more with your attitude and your disposition. How do we use this word now, moderation? We use the word now primarily to talk about avoiding extremes in usually either in the realm of politics and mostly in the realm of food, right? That's how I've heard it, you know? You know, eating your ice cream on Sunday night, only one scoop, everything in moderation, you know? That's been pretty much, in our language, how we apply this principle of moderation. Now, let me just say that 
that is probably good advice, right? Everything, it's, it's good to not live in excess in things of, of habit things. But the idea of the word in the 1500s and the idea of the Greek word here is not talking about our habits, our eating habits or our political opinions. It's talking about our disposition. And no doubt our disposition and our attitude affects our habits, doesn't it? But that's not the concept here. It's not talking about our cookie eating habits in this verse or how much you love, you know, my wife likes Ben's pretzels at Walmart. You know, it's not Misty, don't eat Ben's pretzels too much. You know, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about our attitude, our spirit. This Greek word appears in the New Testament five times. And in the King James Version, it's translated three times as gentle, one time as patient, and then this other time, moderation. So I think this idea of gentleness or reasonableness really captures the meaning of this verse. Let your moderation, let your gentleness, your reasonableness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. What is Paul saying here? Why is he saying this? Paul is telling the people in Philippi that they need to manifest a gentleness in their life. What is gentleness? What is he talking about? He's talking about avoiding anger and harshness and unnecessary aggression. Now, Jesus was our perfect example, wasn't he? Jesus was gentle. And you say, wait, 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 wait. Remember that one time Jesus got a whip and went to the temple and threw the tables over and was whipping people? That doesn't sound very gentle, does it? See, ah, that's a good point. That shows that our definition of gentle is not biblical. Because gentleness does not mean that you never get excited or you never get passionate or you never get angry. That's not biblical gentleness. Biblical gentleness is a disposition of grace and love towards people. And that's what Paul is telling them here. We need to live with this kind of disposition. We know that Gentleness is also a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? As we're living Spirit-filled, we become less aggressive and harsh and rude and crude, and we become more gentle. Scripture says, only by pride cometh contention. So there's also a humility aspect of gentleness, isn't there? If we're going to be gentle, we need to be humble. When we're prideful, we tend to be coarse with people, don't we? How dare you talk to me that way? Don't you know who I am? You know, or whatever it is. We get an elevated opinion of ourselves, then we tend to lose our gentleness. Paul is saying here, these believers needed to be gentle in front of all men. Christians should not fly off the handle in anger. We should not allow our emotions to produce hurtful speech. We should not respond harshly to people. Notice how the verse says, all men. This means everybody, especially people in our family. I think that's where we drop the ball the most, isn't it, is our family. I remember times, I I don't remember the exact argument because I don't have that good of a memory, but I do remember Misty and I being in a pretty heated argument one time, and my phone rang, and I just remember going, ah, you know, I was getting onto her in anger, and then I said, hi, Mrs. So-and-so, how are you doing? And I was immediately convicted. Have you ever done that? You go from raging on somebody to, hi, Mrs. Jones, how's your day? Lord bless you, you know. We can do that, can't we? We tend to be more open with our families, and that openness can lead to some harshness, some cruelness. Paul's saying here in verse, what verse are we in? Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. That's everybody. As believers, if we polled the whole room and asked, how's this so-and-so? What's their temperament like? They should say, hmm, they're kind, they're gentle, they're gracious, they're loving. That is the way that we need to be as believers. So I ask you, how are you doing in this area of gentleness, this area of moderation? How do we get that way? How do we become more gentle? How do we grow in this area? Well, actually, I think point one and two are going to help. I think if we seek unity, that's going to help us to be gentle when we're unified. 
I think if we find our joy in God, we're going to be more gentle and more loving. But I think the biggest thing is because gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit, I think we need to really focus on walking in the Spirit. It's, we're much less likely to bark or bite our spouse's head off if we just finish praying, aren't we? Lord, thank you so much for Misty. She's been such a great wife. Why would you do that? You know, that doesn't go together, does it? Because when we are walking in the Spirit and God's Spirit is controlling and influencing us, we are going to be more gentle, more humble, more loving. So, I ask you tonight, are you standing fast in the Lord? Paul loved these people. He cared for them so deeply. He expressed it so much, and his main concern is that they stood fast in the Lord. And then he gave them these important ingredients, these important advices, these commands. So how are you doing in these areas tonight? How are you doing in this area of unity? Let me just ask, is there something between you and somebody in this church right now? If there is, please deal with that. Go to them. Pursue peace. Pursue unity. How are you doing in this area of rejoicing in the Lord? Do you have joy? Do you have joy tonight? Can you say, I'm rejoicing in the Lord? How are you doing in this area of being gentle, moderate, and reasonable? Are you prone to fly off the handle? Well, that's just my personality. That's how I am. Sounds like you need to change. Because that's not Christ-like, is it? Paul's commanding them to be gentle. These are important things. They're important for us. If we're going to stand fast in the Lord, these are areas we need to work on. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your instruction. Lord, you're patient with us, and you give us reminders over and over again. And many of these themes, Lord, we saw earlier in the book. We see them in other epistles. We see them... In the Gospels, Lord, you are long-suffering with us, and you remind us over and over again the truths we need to hear. Thank you for your patience, Lord. Help us to, to improve in these areas. Help us to be quick to resolve conflict. Help us to find our joy in you, Lord. It's going to make such a difference in this place if it's filled with believers who are joyful in you. Help me, Lord, to find my joy completely and wholly in you. Lord, I don't know how you've worked in hearts, but I trust that your word has convicted somebody tonight. Please help them to soften their hearts and to respond to your word. Bless this time ahead, Lord, as we pray on these things. I ask this in your name. Amen. I want to give you some time. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's done in your heart tonight, but please talk to God about these areas. Ask him to reveal if you're falling short and ask him to help you if you need to improve in these areas.